Siren Kierkegaard, Various Readings, Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7, Soren Kierkegaard, by David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota, Editor A. M. Strudevant, February 1920, Chapters 4 and 5, Pages 8 through 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Regine and Socrates Chapter 4 In September 1840, Kierkegaard became engaged to Regine Olson. This young woman of 17 had an important influence upon his authorship. So important, indeed, that it was Kierkegaard's expressed desire that the entire literature should after his death be dedicated jointly to his father and to her. A graceful and attractive figure, she was a child of joy and sunshine. So complete a contrast did she present to the profound melancholy and many-tongued reflection which was Kierkegaard's own inmost self that, quote, it was as if Simeon Stylites had stepped down from his pillar to invite a young lady of beauty and fashion to share his narrow pedestal. Quote by George Brandes. Kierkegaard thought it possible and permissible to conceal the symptoms of his own inner unhappiness. He believed it his duty to use, for this purpose, his native liveliness of wit and whatever acquired virtuosity and concealment he possessed and so make possible the realization of the projected marriage. Quote, My father was the most melancholy man I have ever known, but he was at his ease and happy the entire day. He needed only to employ an hour at night to drain, like Loki's wife, the cup of his bitterness. This sufficed to make him sound again. For my part, I do not even require as much time as this only a moment or two as opportunity offers, and all is well with me once more. From the bitterness of my melancholy I distill a joy, a sympathy, a tenderness of feeling, which surely cannot embitter anyone's life. I will not marry in order to compel another to share the burden of my melancholy. For me, therefore, marriage presents a most difficult problem, an anxious task, but it is also my dearest wish. End quote. Such were the ideas with which he entered into the engagement, but the moment he faced the situation at close range, the principle of concealment began to appear untenable, a violation of that spirit of mutual confidence and understanding which he considered fundamental to the marriage relation. His frail health, concerning which he obtained a physician's unfavorable prognosis, his melancholy, which he looked upon as unconquerable, his penitence for sins of youth, all rose up in protest against him to make impossible the realization of his love in marriage. For a year he wrestled with the problem. In October 1841, he broke the engagement. The journals are filled with echoes of this experience, and the Kierkegaardian literature is largely built up about it though it cannot justly be said that the appropriate imaginative transformation of the material is ever neglected. In the journals of 1849, when his former fiancé had been for some years happily married, and at a time when the death of her father had given him a new impulse to reflect upon the relation between them, he reviews the story of the engagement in several parallel accounts. One of these, under the motto, Infendum me jubes, Regina, Renover Delorum. You ask me to renew, O Queen, an unspeakable grief, describes the proposal, the engagement, and the subsequent inner struggles between his conscience and his love. Quote, Inwardly, almost the next day, I saw that I had made a mistake. A penitent, such as I was, my vita anta octa, my life before, my melancholy, these were enough. I suffered indescribably all the time. End quote. The year of the engagement falls by this account into five periods, each of which is briefly characterized. 
In the first, he suffers from his melancholy and his conscience, reproaching himself with having torn her loose from her moorings. In the second, quote, she gives herself free rein in a boundless self-assurance. At once my melancholy with respect to the engagement disappears. I breathe freely again. Here is a fault on my side. I should have taken advantage of this period to permit her to break the engagement. It would then have been a triumph for her. But the problem of realizing a marriage was too serious a problem for me. And besides, there was something childish in her presumption. End quote. In the third, quote, she yields herself in complete devotion and is transfigured into the most lovable creature imaginable. End quote. His first difficulty now returns, intensified by the sight of her devotion and by the sense of his own responsibility. In the fourth, he comes to the conclusion that a separation is unavoidable and writes her the following note reprinted verbatim in Stages on the Way of Life. Not too often to experiment with something that must in any event be done, and which, when it is done, will undoubtedly give the needed strength. Let it now be done. Above all, forget him who writes this note. Forget a man who, whatever may be his powers, could never make a woman happy. In the Orient, the sending of a silken noose means death for the recipient. In this case, the return of a ring will undoubtedly mean death for the sender. End of that quote. She refused, however, to let the matter rest with this decision. Quote, In my absence, she comes up to my room and writes me a desperate note, adjuring me, for Christ's sake, and by the memory of my deceased father, not to leave her. End quote. The crisis was temporarily postponed, in the meanwhile, Kierkegaard attempted to make himself obnoxious to her, quote, if possible to sustain her by a deception and to incite her pride, end quote. Two months later, he broke the engagement for the second time, despite her protests and those of her father. The gossip in Copenhagen accused Kierkegaard of experimenting with the affections of his fiancée. He himself went so far as to lend some encouragement to this opinion, thinking it might strengthen her self-assertion and sense of independence. His brother, a few days after the event, threatened to call on the Olsons and show them that Kierkegaard was not a scoundrel. If you do, was a vehement reply, I'll put a bullet through your head. This was the experience which placed Kierkegaard almost at a stroke in the full possession of his ascetic and literary powers. The wealth of feeling which derives from it and centers about it constitutes a rich vein in the Kierkegaardian literature and is one of its prime claims to distinction. The experience had probed deep that he should have ventured upon an undertaking which he could not fulfill and that he had been compelled to sacrifice his honor in the breaking of a solemn pact stirred his sense of pride and self-feeling profoundly. A passage in either or reflects one of the moods in which he reacts on the experience. What I need is a voice as penetrating as the eye of a lynceus, as terrifying as the sight of a giant, as persistent as the sound of nature, as full of derision as a frosty gust of wind, as malicious as echoes heartless mockeries, running the gamut from the deepest bass to the most mellifluous soprano and capable of modulation from the softest whisper to the utmost pitch of raging energy. All this I need in order to relieve my spirit of its burden and to get expression for what is on my mind, to stir the bowels of my sympathy and wrath. End of that quote. What the ethicist in either or thus desires, Kierkegaard came to possess in the fullest measure, for his unhappy love affair had made him an imaginative writer of the first rank. But the experience had, according to his own interpretation of it, also a deeper import. It gave his life its definite and final direction. Quote, when I broke with her, he writes, 
my impression was either sensuality in extremest measure or else absolute religiosity and that according to a standard quite different from the clergyman's melange End quote. the latter alternative was at bottom already chosen prepared for by his father's discipline and matured by the very motives operating to bring on the crisis above described he came to make a beginning in two different places at one and the same time namely as a poetic and as a religious nature such is his own epigrammatic description of the situation Quote, because of my previous religious training the fact in question inserted bracket the broken engagement took hold of me in a far deeper manner than would otherwise have been possible it annihilated to a certain degree in religious impatience the poet that had been born within me the poetic within me therefore became something essentially foreign something that had merely happened to me the religious awakened on the other hand though not indeed produced by myself nevertheless came to possess the most intimate relation to myself that is in the poet i did not recognize myself in the deepest sense but rather in the religious awakening End quote. however the poetic endowment demanded expression the religious side of his nature being the deeper self took it in charge and made it serve its own purposes all the while it stood waiting as it were for the ascetic productivity to be got through with as soon as possible the authorship bears the mark of this situation since it has from the first a double character ascetic and religious and during the production of his ascetic writings kierkegaard tells us quote, the author himself lived in categories that were decisively religious End quote. Five. the number of external influences to which kierkegaard reacted was considerable an author may gain a certain degree of originality through mere exclusion but the individual stamp and coloring so highly characteristic of the kierkegaardian literature is the consequence rather of an intensiveness in the personal reaction and of an energetic assimilation of the given influences what an author is able to write the day after his library has been burned has been suggested as a crucial test of his resourcefulness. Almost every line of Kierkegaard's seems to meet such a condition. So little is it the product of a bookish erudition, and so completely is it the expression of a free creative energy. Nevertheless, many general intellectual influences revealed themselves in his work and entered deeply into its form and structure. As a true son of his native land, his inheritance included the full wealth of Danish culture as expressed in its literature. But of all Danish writers, he appears to owe most to Holberg, the great pioneer of Danish comedy. Holberg's humor is something which Kierkegaard may almost be said to have absorbed in succum et sanguinum, into blood and spirits. The Holberg comedies served him for a veritable language, and the more technical philosophical treatises are replete with references to Holbergian characters and situations, giving substance and mass to the delicate comedy of their fine-spun polemic. Kierkegaard offers many points of contact with Romanticism. The style of the ascetic pseudonyms has an emotional intensity and abandon, a lyrical effervescence, at times an extravagance of feeling and statement, verging close upon the limits of the rational. By way of contrast, the religious discourses are written in a style noticeably sober, even, and restrained. The involved literary structure of the pseudonyms, with one author inside another like the compartments of a Chinese box, has also been cited as a romantic trait. More significant, however, is the strong attraction which Kierkegaard felt, in common with most romanticists, for the primitive in folklore, ballads, and sagas. He made systematic studies of the great representative figures that stand out so strongly for the medieval imagination 
a Don Juan, a Faust, the Wandering Jew, a Robin Hood. And he shares with the German romanticists an unbounded admiration for Shakespeare. Of a rich Shakespearean insight, he makes liberal use for his own delineation of the passions. Though he may be said to have had a sympathetic appreciation of the German Romantic movement, his dissertation on the concept of irony reveals him as a severe critic of its aberrations. His attitude was on the whole too objective and analytic for him to be classified as a Romanticist. Kierkegaard's relation to Hegel was that of a student sufficiently docile to absorb the master's teaching, but whose matured criticism just on that account became all the more dangerously destructive. To Hegel he owes his mastery of a precise and finished philosophical terminology, and Hegel's influence may perhaps also be traced in the frequent reversion to an algebraic abstract style clashing somewhat strangely with expressions vividly poetic in their concreteness. But undoubtedly the most important and the most intimate influence leaving its mark upon Kierkegaard's work and thought was the personality of Socrates. His dissertation was an interpretation of Socrates from the point of view of the Socratic irony. This study reveals a sympathetic appreciation of the Athenian sage and became the point of departure for an increasingly deeper understanding culminating in the sense of an intimate spiritual kinship. Kierkegaard recognized in his own life work the fulfillment of an ethical and intellectual task analogous to that which Socrates performed for ancient Greece. This thought received its first expression in the journals immediately after the publication of Either Or. There once was a young man happily gifted as an Alcibiades. He went astray in the world and in his distress looked about him for a Socrates, but he could not find one among his contemporaries. Then he asked the gods to transform him into a Socrates. And behold, the young man who had been so proud of being an Alcibiades was so ashamed and humbled by the grace the gods had bestowed upon him that when he had received a gift of which he might well be proud, he felt himself the humblest of all. End of quote. Twelve years later, while engaged in the agitation which stirred Denmark so profoundly, he expressed the same thought more emphatically, reading into it a still deeper import. Quote, the point of view which I have to represent and expound is so absolutely unique that in the 1800 years of the history of Christendom there is, quite literally, nothing analogous or corresponding to which I might link myself. In this sense also, over against the 1800 years, I stand alone. The only analogy I have is Socrates. My task is a Socratic task to revise the conception of what it means to be a Christian. I do not call myself a Christian, parenthesis, keeping the ideal free, end parenthesis, but I can reveal the fact that the others are still less entitled to the name than I am. O noble, simple sage of antiquity, the only human being whom I admiringly acknowledge as a thinker, there is but little which tradition has handed down concerning you, true and only martyr of the intellect, equally great as character and as thinker. But that little, how infinitely much! How have I not longed, living in the midst of these battalions of thinkers that Christendom bring out into the field as Christian thinkers, parenthesis, for otherwise, in the course of the centuries, there have lived in Christendom a few individual thinkers of significance, End of parenthesis. How have I not longed for one short hour of converse with you? Christendom has been sunk into a veritable abyss of sophistry, far worse than that which prevailed when the sophists flourished in Greece. These legions of preachers and Christian docents are all sophists, earning their livelihood. Here is the ancient mark of the sophist, by filling with delusions the minds of those who understand nothing and then making this mass 
this number, this human majority, the test and standard of Christianity and truth. But I do not call myself a Christian. That this is very embarrassing to the sophists, I understand very well. And I understand, too, that they would much prefer that I should loudly proclaim myself the only true Christian. And I know very well that the attempt has been made, untruthfully, to represent my agitation in this light. But I will not allow myself to be made a fool of. I do not call myself a Christian. O oh, Socrates, if you had only loudly proclaimed yourself the wisest man in Greece, the sophists would soon have been able to finish it off with you. No, no, you made yourself ignorant, but at the same time you had the malicious characteristic that you could expose the fact, parenthesis, precisely as being ignorant, in parenthesis, that the others had still less knowledge than you, they who did not even know that they were ignorant. End of quotation. An estimate of Kierkegaard's total significance in these terms, it would require a more comprehensive and detailed study of his entire career to motivate. But it may be of interest simply to name a number of individual traits in his personality and his work which have a strong Socratic coloring. Such, for example, is his talent for conversation and for establishing a point of contact with all sorts and conditions of men. Such also is his living enthusiasm, wrapped in an objectifying reflection. We note, too, a concentration of interest upon morals, with a corresponding depreciation of the significance of natural science and cosmological speculation, a devotion to the maiutic method and great skill in its exercise, and a tendency to ironical self-isolation. The instrumental subordination of the conceptual apparatus of thought to the ends of the personality, and a consequent high contempt for objective and external results is also a Socratic trait. And finally, we have in Kierkegaard a concretely polemic attitude toward the currents of contemporary life expressed in intimate personal contact and with the assumption of some degree of personal risk and peril. End of recording. Regine and Socrates. Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7. Soren Kierkegaard. By David F. Swenson. Pages 8 to 15.